speakers, so um, you know, things continue. Um, yes, I was just reading some a pop up here. So we also said they're doctored images, images that are completely fabricated, that are wrong, but um, continue uh, going through uh, social media during times of campaigns. We talked about how both uh, accounts are doing the job these days. So accounts that do not have really people behind them, they are just bots, but they continue to share information that is false during the election process. We also um, talked about fabricated headlines where the headline that has been put on the story is not the same as the body. The body is false. Uh, the headline may be accurate, or sometimes the headline is inaccurate, but the context is really uh, false. So we say there are some information, uh, false information that can manifest or can spread like that during elections. We also talked about the hashtags, the trending hashtags that uh, you will see uh, hash, hash, hashtags trending on social media, uh, pushing a certain narrative. Sometimes those narratives may not be accurate as uh, we hope or we want them to be. So that is, uh, those are a few pointers we talked about how false information manifests. Then we talked about the potential risks you face as journalists who are covering elections and fact checkers. And the first one we said there will be a lot of information overload. You get a lot of information and sometimes it may be difficult for you to peruse through all that information. Then we also talked about the challenge of arrests and imprisonments. Uh, various journalists are arrested. We talked about internet shutdown, which is a common phenomenon in Africa. Um, you know, the government sometimes may switch off the internet or the social media platforms, and that may be a challenge uh, for a journalist who's serving at such a time. We also mentioned the beatings. Uh, so many people are beaten, rubber bullets, uh, you know, beaten using batons. So those are some of the challenges that you face. Some have unfortunately got permanent injuries. Uh, some have got temporary injuries. So those are some of the things that you will face. Uh, then you said access to data is another a very, very big challenge or a, a potential challenge that you're going to face as a, a fact checker or a journalist during elections. The data is minimal. And sometimes the data you get is even old and outdated and cannot be used at a time like this one. Uh, so we talked about yeah, intimidation. As journalists, you'll be intimidated. I played a video of the IGP of Uganda, uh, Mr. Oche Ochola, who was share, saying that we shall beat you journalists uh, to protect you. So those are the intimidations. We talked about spying or espionage, like you as a, a journalist, they will spy on you. They will try to find out, uh, track your phone, the data that is in your phone, who have you called. Uh, so those are some of the challenges and the risks that you get. Also. You mentioned bureaucratic interferences that the, the state interferes with your work. They, they lock down the media house. Uh, they arrest the journalist and things like that. So those are some of the, the challenges that you face. So we also talked about how you can solve these uh, challenges. We say that uh, uh, ensure a network with other journalists. You have to be having a connection with uh, different journalists because you know the many are the merrier. That means the more you are, the stronger you get. When you are isolated, you will have a, a problem as a journalist. We also say that you have to be going to these polling stations. At a time like uh, the election processes, you realize that false information can go. But if you see a video that is inaccurate and it's said to be from South Sudan, is are you able to go to that polling station? Are you able to check through the voters registrars? Are you able to check through uh, the number of votes that were casted? Are you able to talk to the agents uh, who have been protecting that vote? Are you able to talk to the people who casted that vote and were able to witness how the entire process was? And so we said uh, those are some of the ways that you can actually uh, be able to fact check during election times. We said you check the official website, check the official website of uh, maybe the Electoral Commission of South Sudan. What has it put on their website? What do they say is uh, are the results that have been got from the various constituencies and the various uh, parishes and polling stations? So we said you can do that. We said in order for, it, for your information to be safe, it is very important that you uh, back it up somewhere, maybe on an external hard drive, maybe on a flash disk, maybe on your drive, or somewhere where you know in case your devices have been confiscated, you can be able to recover the information that you already have. And then lastly, we said you should have a member at the tally center, someone who is seated where the, um, all the votes that have been casted uh, in the entire electoral process are, are being counted from. So you should have someone who's seated at that tally center. Normally in Uganda, I told you we have Nambole Mandela National Stadium. That's where most of those uh, 
uh, votes that are casted come, and that's where the counting of the national uh, votes is done. So we said have someone who's at a target center to help you in accessing data in getting the number of votes from various constituencies, which will be able, which will help you to be able to fact check the false information during elections. Um, I think uh, that would be enough for just a recap. So today, the main emphasis uh, for our training uh, today is going to be uh, not something that is really, really um, so different, uh, so different from what we talked about. But this is, these are just more. We are talking about really the impact of uh, false information on uh, uh, elections, and we are also going to talk about the dangers or and long-term effects of. Uh, false information on elections. What are those long-term effects that false information brings to the electoral process of any particular country? So we are also going to look at how to identify similar sources of false information during elections. You realize that sometimes people have an agenda that they are trying to push. So um, various sources can start uh, pushing a certain narrative or pushing certain information that will help them achieve their vision. So how do you identify similar sources of false information? Because you uh, realize that they're always there. There are some similar ones that look like each other. They have the same characteristics. How do you distinctively mark uh, these, char these characteristics? Um, also, uh, we're going to look at the role of fact checking, what does fact checking do in, in um, you know fostering democracy and uh, you know voter knowledge on politics or on elections? So how do you as a fact checker? How does your work as a fact checker foster democracy, ensure that they, they are free and fair election? We shall be also uh, talking about that, and maybe lastly, we shall share some lessons. Uh, that you need that you can take as South Sudan fact checkers. Um, what are some of the things that you can learn from other fact checkers, from other journalists who have, uh, you know, uh, maneuvered this uh, situation? So, shall be just giving you a few tips. Do not please he hesitate to just send me a direct message in case you have a question, uh, in case you want to comment. Feel free to just, uh, you know, um, unmute yourself and uh, share anything you'd want uh, to share. So. Allow me to um, continue. So first, uh, what are the training outcomes from me on my side? For me, I hope that at the end of this training, journalists are able to understand the impact of false information on elections. So what is the impact of this false information? Uh, at the end of this day, uh, journalists yourselves will be able to understand the dangers and long-term effects of false information on the electoral processes. What are those effects that will always hang um, over and over the electoral process? You realize that there are some things that do not just create an impact for one election, they create an impact for the various elections to come. How you start your election process, I'm telling you, is how the election is going to continue or the election culture that you're going to adapt. That is a challenge that we are facing here that we did not start with democracy at the first time, really. We started with, with wanting um, certain people to win certain positions. Now, um, uh, we started elections, I think that was in 1995 when we started actively uh, doing elections, 1996. So from 1996, that's what, 28 years, we still have the same problems that we faced in 1996, recurring in 2021, some even being worse. We have seen that in the recent, recently, I think even this year, the president has come out to say, we cannot allow this, but he is saying we cannot allow this, but he was really uh, someone who has been fostering such, such, such things to happen. So you realize that there, there are challenges that will always uh, hang over or that will always hang over to a deep, to another election. So uh, in, at the end of this election, I hope that you will be able to understand these long-term effects and maybe how we can fight them. And then I also hope that journalists are able to understand and identify familiar false um, information that influences sources, uh, that influences elections. So uh, we're going to talk about the sources of this familiar information, how do they look like? How do you know that uh, these people are at the same agenda? And at the end of the day, how can it influence elections? Then we are also going to talk about journalists. Uh, um, we hope that at the end of the, after this training, journalists are able to understand the role of fact-checking in fostering democracy. I already talked about that. Then at the end of the day, uh, journalists will have some key lessons uh, to learn from other fact-checkers uh, because you realize that we all have to understand from each other. We need each other at the end of the day to be able to build a better continent and a better country. 
Um, so let's continue. First, I'll start with impacts of false information on election. So here, what does false information do to the election? What are some of the effects of false information or wrong information or misinformation on the elections or the electoral process of any country? And these are some of the um, some of uh, uh, the pointers therein. First of all, false information can lead to biased voters. Uh, that is a common phenomenon, especially in countries like ourselves. Uh, we have people who are biased at the end of the day because they have received a lot of information. Sometimes this information has been false. Sometimes this information is true. But at the end of the day, when people get this information, it gives them a bias. A bias is when someone has a preconceived idea or feeling in them uh, before even anything happens. For them, they are biased. Like in Uganda, I'm going to give you a very good example here. In Uganda, we have a common challenge of voter, low voter turnout. Very few people wake up from their homes to go and cast their vote. This is because many of them have accepted or have believed that uh, the election is going to do nothing. And if you even come here, you will hear people who have uh, narratives like, what can a, a paper do, right? Because we have had a common phenomenon from the time we got independence in 1962, that we have never carried out a free and fair elections. Ugandans themselves have never had the ability uh, to wake up in the morning to say, this is the leader of our choice. This is the man we have casted our vote for. This is the man that is supposed to lead us. So uh, from 1962 up to now, we have never had a change of government using the, the ballot. So up to today, people have believed that uh, elections will not do anything. President Museveni, if he's on the ballot paper, he has already won. To some extent, they may be true, but it shows you how information can bias our voters. So if you share, or when a lot of false information is shared during elections, people become biased. Many people have uh, a feeling that is negative. Some people have a, a positive feeling uh, towards election, but at the end of the day, you have people who are biased. And when people are biased, that means even the decisions they are going to make are biased decisions. That's why we have a narrative here that you give me money, the person who gives me money is the person I'm voting. Uh, people no longer know the power of the vote. So when you give uh, someone 1,000 Uganda shillings, uh, that's just like, I don't know, like three cents or something, that's very little money. Uh, people are willing to vote for you just because you've given them 1,000 shillings, just because you've given them a kilogram of sugar or a buy of soap. So uh, people have become biased. They don't really want to know um, about the elections for them. When election time comes, it's a time to reap money. It's a time to get money. That's why it's also another challenge to the politicians because now if you're a broke guy, you cannot be able to lead in this country because the narrative has come that you have to feed the population. And even when you tell them anything, they will not listen as long as you've given them something for their vote. So that shows you how information um, uh, can create a biased population. Then the other um, impact is that um, it undermines trust in the electoral processes. Same thing as biased voting, voters, but this is even bigger, that people no longer trust election processes, at least according to Uganda here. There is no election that we have had since 2001, and someone has said that this one was won uh, free and fairly. From 2001, Vesiji uh, has been telling you that uh, we have no, uh, my, my, I was rigged in uh, you know, 2001, I was rigged in 2006, I was rigged in 2011, I was rigged in 2016. Chagulani Bobi Wine recently also said he was rigged in 2021. But this uh, sometimes may not be accurate, but because there is information that has been flowing in uh, the public domain that says that, hey, these people steal our elections. A few videos here and there say that uh, they have read, people have narratives that they are pre-ticked ballots that happen in, uh, you know, uh, soldiers' barracks and things like that. So at the end of the day, people no longer have trust in the electoral processes. This is the same reason why um, the sitting president today went to the Bush in 1980. It was, I, according to what he said, many people may dispute it, but according to him, it's because the elections in 1980 were not free and fair. So they could not trust Paul Mwanga's election and he had to go to the bush, fight up to 1986 and take power. So what does that show you? People no longer have trust in electoral processes. So in 1980, Museven did not have trust in the electoral processes uh, that were happening. In 2021, we still have that very same challenge. People no longer have trust in the electoral processes. And this 
uh, mistrust sometimes is shaped are based on inaccurate information, on sometimes propaganda, sometimes based on politics. But you, you realize that in the rural areas, to some extent, the president can be able to go and win elections there. But because of uh, you know the undermined uh, electoral process and less trust of uh, the electoral process, and generally, by the way, Uganda has generally a trust issues. We no longer trust anything government says. So that shows you that uh, it undermines the trust in the electoral processes. And this, Free and fair elections is the only pathway that is legally mandated by the constitution to change government. So if that cannot happen, it breeds some other effects. I'll talk about those. Then it undermines the credibility of government institutions. I am, now that this is a bigger picture. Because of uh, false information, many people have lost trust in government generally. Everybody, it may, may be the Minister of Finance, be it the Ministry of Gender, be it anything, people no longer trust anybody just because of information that they have seen. And I can say, it is not that all the information that they have seen is false, but yes, some information may be true, but then there are some false information that people believe. Remember, because they already have a preconceived bias. They already believe that uh, this government is unfair to us. Then if, you, if they hear just even a small rumor that, this minister uh, took this amount of money, or this minister uh, paid these voters to, to vote for him, or he rigged this election in a certain way. It's very easy for them to accept because it's already biased in them. It's already imputed in them that there is a mistrust there. In so, at the end of the day, we realize that people no longer have trust in government. Whatever government brings, even the least like um, what vaccination. People no longer trust things like that because generally there is a mistrust, a hangover of mistrust for government institution. And this has been bred by a lot of false information that it goes on uh, of every time. Lastly, um, or lastly but not least, you have division among the population. So the population has become divided at the end of the day. Uh, some people have a narrative they believe in, others have a narrative they don't, they, they, they believe in. So they all have varying narratives. People believe in another thing and this uh, also, and others believe in something different. So this division sometimes is fueled based on false information. Someone may bring a video that is out of context that was shot from another country. So this is what you NRM people are doing. That's how they call them here. Uh, the, the, the NRM guys, those are the people who are on the 70 side. So they, those the, the NRM call NUP, they call them bandits. Uh, these people, you people are bandits. Uh, you are people who uh, have a lot of false information. So you realize that everybody is at loggerheads. And you've seen this happen even play out in the election processes where uh, the, the, the supporters of one candidate fight the supporters of another. The most recent was 2000, um, I think 20, 2018, there was a by-election in Arua. President Museveni was there uh, to campaign for his candidate for member of parliament. Uh, then Robert Chagulani Sentam was also there uh, to advocate for Kassian Wadri, his candidate. So when they met uh, the voters of Chagulani and the voters of uh, uh, Mr. Museveni uh, were able to clash people forward. So that shows you how, uh, the, how um, false information can divide the population at the end of the day. We even saw that during um, the 2021 protests by the way, um, the Richard one protests are those protests that happened in November prior to the election. And uh, in fact, they are 2020. That was prior to the election in 2021. So uh, we had a lot of riots and over 50 Ugandans lost their lives, unfortunately. But most of these people, when you realize why they were fighting, they were antagonistic. Uh, many of them uh, even started fighting by hearing the rumor that Chagulani had been arrested even before he had been arrested. Uh, so you, you realize that the division has always been there. Uh, people no longer like to, to look at each other. And, and, and this division, in the long term, a few as anarchy. You know what has happened in, in East Africa here. We can talk about cases in Rwanda, 1994, what that division really does at the end of the day. So false information creates a division among the population. Then it also fuels violence. Uh, I've talked about that. The first, um, the first protest that happened on 18th November uh, prior to uh, the second one that happened on 19th, because we had two days of protests, 18th and 19th. But on the 18th, Chagulani had actually not yet been arrested when the protests broke out. It was just people who shared rumors on social media that, hey, 
your presidential candidate has been arrested. And my God, uh, people from Jinja, people from the Northern Uganda, people from the Central started breaking havoc. When they go to understand that this gentleman has had actually been driven home, that's when we realized that protests had to go down. But even uh, before go going down, uh, many of, of Ugandans had lost their lives. So same story as uh, 19th. And this has been a common phenomenon where people protest basing on rumors, basing on things that are actually not there or not accurate. But because one person shares a rumor that people enjoy to listen to, they'll be able to and uh, you know, make decisions. And sometimes, you know, violence it is the rest as well. When someone feels that they're differentiated, they cannot listen to them, government institutions cannot be trusted. Where do they go? They have to pick the barrel of the gun because that's the only way you will listen. Because yeah, there is a saying that humans listen to guns more than words. So when uh, people are differentiated, the only thing they feel they can do is fight for themselves, is to protest, is to use whatever they can use in order for them to protect um, you know, their legitimacy, their, 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 um, that, that thing, that the love they have for their country, because it's their country. And of course, um, you have to respect them, to, 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 respect, to tolerate the majority, but also respect the minority, because that, that is what democracy says. So violence has been fueled by a lot of false information and a lot of inaccurate information that goes on, especially uh, during elections. Um, then lastly, it affects the beliefs, attitudes, and behavior of the people. I, I think everything I've talked about here uh, really at the end of the day shapes the people, the things that people believe in, the attitudes they have towards elections, um, you know, the behavior they have towards elections. That's why I've told you many Ugandans will stay at home during the elections. Many don't care because they realize whether you do what, whether you do what, the person who is going to be president or the person who's going to come out as leader is that person who is the incumbent. So that shows you the beliefs, attitudes, and the behavior of, of people. But at the end of the day, this may not be true because to some extent, you realize that this gentleman, he wins these elections because he, he wins the rural areas. And, and we just look at Kampala and the central here, but how many people are in Kampala? They're like not more than 7 million Ugandans, but how many Ugandans do we have? There are 49 million Ugandans. So there are many million Ugandans who are out there and actually maybe voting for President Museveni because they like him, because they know him, because they trust him. He's been there for a while. Many, many rural Ugandans uh, vote for him, but because of false information, because of narratives, because of stereotypes that have been believed, people have actually shunned uh, you know, the, the election processes have shunned elections. And I think even 2026, it's going to be worse because 2021 was a time when Uganda decided, hey, let's vote in big numbers. And the voter turn up was, was big because there was a new candidate. Mm, this candidate was young. Uh, he was resonating with the stories of many Ugandans. People see him and they see themselves. Uh, his story resonates with many. They have seen him go. So you realize that people came in big numbers because they hoped uh, that in 2021 it would be done, but still it did not happen. Now, when you do right now a poll of 2026, what do you expect as Ugandans? Many of them have given up. And it comes at a time when the opposition is also breaking. They're also money oriented. They're also stealing. They're also betraying. So it shows you that uh, many people no longer trust elections and politics in this country, which at the end of the day is something that is very, very wrong. So um, this is a video I want you gentlemen to watch uh, just a minute. I don't know if I can pause it here. Okay. I want you to watch this video. Uh, this video is um, a story that was done by C CGTN, uh, that is the China Global Television Network, about uh, the elections of Kenya in 2017. Remember, Kenya went for elections twice, right? Uh, so this gentleman did a story about how false information affected that 2017 um, uh, uh, vote or election that was carried out, where Uhuru Kenyatta was actually able to win after uh, you know the court declared that uh, the, 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 that the, the election was going to be re redone because of irregularities and here and there. But this is what false information really did or contributed to what happened in Kenya. So. Now, uh, let me just play for you this video and tell me what you think.
Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, um, thank you so much. Oh, I don't know. You people did not hear the audio. Um, anybody who can just share about what they watched and what they think. You can unmute yourself. Oh, completely no sound. Um, so sorry about that. Let me see if uh, when I play it from outside Canva, you can be able to hear uh, what this gentleman had to say. Uh, just a minute, I'll try to. Is it? Is it? Alien. You see, let me try to share those videos and I see if, if you can hear the sound. Okay. Okay. You'll be able to tell me if you can hear. Um, the voice now. Um, can you can you hear and watch now very well? Someone just unmute to confirm to me. Okay. Can we now um, hear this this video very well? Yes. 
Can you hear the sound now? No sound again. Oh, sorry. There's no sound. There is no sound. So I think I'll be able to share the videos later on uh, because I don't know why it's not it's not really uh, you know playing the sound because the sound has to be there. But uh, just to, to to tell you what that video was really about, it was. Um, it was just a video of uh, how false information affected the Kenyan populace. And uh, this is not conclusive to say that uh, because of false information that was going on, um, the election was mad with a lot of uh, you know irregularities that led to it being uh, repeated again. But then there is also a study to how much uh, false information really affected that particular election. So whereas it, it, it did not affect it 100%, but there was a, a level of interference that was caused by, um, you know, false information that was shared at that time. So um, I'll share these videos with uh, the team to be able to share with you later on after this particular training. I don't know why um, the sound is playing games with me here. But as we continue, uh, allow me just talk about the dangers and long-term effects of false information. So what are those dangers that false information brings to the entire electoral process, especially uh, for countries that are starting out that have a, a young democracy, countries like Uganda, countries like South Sudan. So what are those long-term effects and dangers that false information can pose uh, to the electoral process from your countries? And um, let me continue here. I told you uh, first it fuels anarchy and war. Um, so many people at the end of the day, when they don't believe in the electoral process of a country, that is the only resort. Uh, they would have to fight for what they believe in. Uh, this has, is a common phenomenon that we have seen in many countries in Africa, our country here, uh, South Sudan there, you've also seen this. Uh, Rwanda has had a fair share. Kenya, you remember in 2007 what happened there. So false information, especially about elections, can fuel anarchy and war. I talked about this issue, division among the population. The population starts to be antagonistic. Some other people see others a certain way. Some other people see others as advantaged, others as less advantaged because, you know, um, because they, some people are in government, some others are not in government. Some people have been affected by the false information. Some people are gaining from the false information. Remember, a false information actually goes two ways. Uh, some people can gain from the false information, but there are those that are disfranchised by the same false information. So division among the populace, we also talked about unfree and fair elections. So false information can undermine that. And sometimes it can actually be true, but all this information overload or information disorder will lead to unfree and fair elections. Elections that are, are not free and fair because some people have a preconceived biases. Some people feel they have not been heard. Some people believe that the information that has been shared is actually inaccurate and uh, it helps a certain um, sect of people. Some others believe that this information may not be, may be accurate, but yet it's not accurate, but it's helping them. So everybody believes what helps them. At the end of the day, you realize that will be there will be a lot of unfair, free and fair uh, elections. Because by the way, being, an election being free and fair does not actually mean the day the election, the, the, the vote is casted, no. The electoral process starts from the day uh, candidates are nominated. In fact, not from the day candidates are nominated. From the day the electoral commission gives a roadmap that this is how the election is looking like. But like, for example, Uganda 2026, we are going to the polls. The polls will be uh, starting in January. Our candidates will be expected to register uh, maybe in June 2025. So all that is the election process. So you realize that an election to be undermined does not mean the casting of the vote, but it means from the time the, the, the electoral commission gave a roadmap to the time the uh, winners are declared. All that is the electoral process. So when that process is marred with a lot of false information, with a lot of inaccurate information, with a lot of misleading content, you realize that many people throughout that process, some will switch sides because they believe a certain narrative. Some people will not even come to vote because they believe a certain narrative. Some people will vote for another person because of a certain narrative they believe in, something that has been preconceived. And in countries like ourselves, you realize we, the journalists, are the people that shape debate. What we talk about 
is what uh, the population follows. What we post on our social media platforms, what we post on our websites, the news we give people, that is what they, at the end of the day, they go and believe and accept, right? So you realize that um, if we share false information, which we sometimes do, if people share false information, if celebrities share false information, the population will make decisions from that information for them. They will receive it because they believe you are the custodians of information. They believe you to be credible. They believe you to know what you're talking about. They believe you that you are their go-to person to get the right information. So when you give them information that is wrong, for them, they make decisions according to the information you have given them. So at the end of the day, you realize false information will undermine the entire electoral process, which leads to unfair, uh, free, unfree and unfair elections. The other thing, it entrenches already preconceived biases. I mentioned this as we are starting, that many people have things they have believed in already. Many people believe that maybe the election or the casting of, of the vote does not change anything. Sometimes they may, they may be true, but sometimes they may not be true. But the information they have put throughout the entire election times, throughout the times they have been practicing elections, that leads to entrenchment. They have preconceived biases. So when you come to election and you show them that, hey, Chablany has been beaten and has been arrested like this in a video that may be inaccurate, for them, they believe it. In case you get a video that has been exported from another country showing people being shot at, people dying, and uh, you know, bleeding, and you say this is Uganda, they will already they will accept it because there have been already cases where people have been shot at, where people have died, where people have been knocked down by cars. So they believe it because it's very easy to believe. It's 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 easy to believe because they already have a preconceived bias. They there is already a link to it. They already have that seed in them that these people can do this. So when you give them a gullible, uh, you know video or you just give them any video from any country, they will gallantly accept it at the end of the day, uh, shaping the things they believe in. Um, the other is um, low voter turnout. So we realize that because of false information that has been preconceived for a long time, there is low voter turnout. People will not come to uh, take part in the voting processes. No, because they ask themselves, why do we even have to vote? They have already voted. Um, people have the belief that the, the machine has already been programmed. So you realize that those are all uh, different challenges that you face here and there. Then uh, we also have another challenge or another danger of false accusations and convictions. So many people will be accused falsely. That's something that you should know. They are, they, they are falsely accused, they are convicted because of things that are actually not accurate. Now, for example, um, there are some people who were convicted during the 2018 by-election in Arua, and they were, they, it was said that these people were the ones that, that threw a stone at the presidential convoy. This was inaccurate. Nobody knows how, how can three, uh, there were more than 30 people, how can 30 people all cast one stone at the presidential motorcade? We are not sure even if that stone was there. Nobody saw the stone. So... These people were arrested. They spent at least six months there. Uh, I think even up to today, they are still going to court and coming out. But this shows you what? That at the end of the day, people have, fallen, have been falsely accused based on something that may be a rumor, something that does not have any evidence uh, to it. Yeah, um, just checking through uh, here, um, the, the chat to see if there is a message. I think it's, there is no message, we can continue. So you realize how false accusation can, can lead to people's imprisonment. Um, it was the same story of some of the colleagues who were arrested in Kalangala during that same election. Uh, people sharing false information that these people had guns, these people had bullets, but it was not even there. But the government came and, and uh, arrested these people. I don't know if they were sure of what they're doing, or it was something that was calculated because at that time they picked most of the team members of Robert Chagulani. Most even his close friend was arrested at that time. His bodyguard was also arrested at that time. So you realize that false accusation can give people basis to undermine an election. So when you arrest people like that without any evidence, just because you had rumors, you realize what this can do to the people. Then it also undermines the voters' knowledge, stroke manipulation. I've told you we have a population that sometimes may be a gullible receiver of information and they may take what they see as the utmost truth. 
So when they get information that is inaccurate, for them, they will, they, they will think it's accurate, they will think it's true, and they will make a decision according to that. So some people, false information can sometimes fuel empathy, yeah, some people will get empathetic, say, oh, you have, they have shot Chagulani's, um, Bob Wayne's uh, supporters, they are dead, they have arrested his friends, they have, um, you know, uh, some people are saying that they, they, they injected Chagulani with some chemicals. So at the end of the day, someone will feel pity on that presidential candidate, and they'll vote for them only because of that reason that, oh, it's a sympathy vote. Let's vote for him at least. Let him at least get the members of parliament. You have to realize these people are manipulated into you know, that sentiment. Some false information can actually amplify happiness. Some people maybe feel jittery and happy. Uh, that, that is how false information makes them feel. So they will also make a decision based on that. But at the end of the day, the people who are sharing this information, especially people who are disinformers, for them, their narrative is being good. They are being welcomed, so they feel comfortable with the status quo. But at the end of the day, they realize that the population is myopic, it's manipulated, and it's actually gullible. So they will not make a decision that is helping them at the end of the day. Then lastly, it induces fear among the masses. This is a common phenomenon in this country. People fear, especially during elections. During elections, you see people entering their homes by 6 p.m. There is a fear that is, is, is interested in them. Many even people fear to go to the polling stations. They think maybe they will be arrested because unfortunately our polling stations are always mad with uh, security personnel, people held, holding guns here and there. So people fear uh, because of uh, this. So you realize that even the false information that may be shared may affect people. People may fear to you know, go out and vote. They say people are being shot out there. Why, why are you going out? What are you doing there? You will be sure. But at the end of the day, you realize there is no protest that is going on. Someone has shared any information that has come from somewhere. But because someone is fearing for their lives, and we know that in Uganda it can happen anytime, you have to fear. So this fear has really been entrenched in the people's minds. And at the end of the day, you realize when people fear the electoral process, who is it going to help? It helps the incumbent. It helps someone who, who does not want them to come out and vote? Because I'm telling you, these disinformers or people who share false information deliberately have a campaign that they are trying to push. They have a narrative that they are trying to put. They have an agenda that they are trying to uh, get at the end of the day or uh, be able to achieve. So at the end of the day, you realize that false information induces fear in the masses. It undermines voters' knowledge and manipulation. It also has cybersecurity concerns. Yes, it's a pathway for hackers. I, I, I missed that point, cybersecurity concerns. Uh, there is a pathway for hackers. So when false information is always on the algorithm of uh, someone's uh, page, Facebook, Twitter, you realize even a hacker, it's easy for them to just you know, manipulate themselves, enter that system because it has been mad with a lot of irregularities. You may not even know that the hacker has actually hacked. You think this is the normal, normal phenomenon that goes on. But cybersecurity concerns are a very, very big danger. Uh, we also had, I think, uh, false information. I did this fact check back in 2021 about, uh, uh, a, 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 they said, a, a certain software. I'm forgetting the name. A certain software that uh, uh, they said was uh, the one that was responsible, uh, that hacked uh, Uganda's system and uh, uh, they manipulated the votes and everything. But it was actually inaccurate. But this thing was going on. I'm just forgetting. But in case you want to watch that video, you can go to our social media. It was a video we did in 2021, very, very um, a long time ago. But it shows you how cybersecurity can actually be linked to inaccurate information. It's very easy for a hacker to come through an algorithm that is already uh, mad with a lot of false information. It is very, very easy uh, for them. Um, I'll just read the message here. Okay. So um, we shall delve into another uh, phenomenon, but before we even continue, is there a question? Uh, this is a video that, that Donald Trump, but because of the sound that is funny, I'll just share it after. But guys, just please tell me, is there any question you have before you continue? Any question, any query, anything to add on, you know, anything? No question? Okay, someone was unmuting. Paulino, 
Uh, you have anything to say, sir? Thank you. Hello? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I don't hear. have anything to ask, but I just joined the chat there, but I'm following mm -hmm. you, so you can continue from there. Maybe okay, if sure. there are any questions. Yeah, thank you. Kali, Kali, thank you so much. I thought you had a question. So now let's continue to how do you identify a similar sources? Uh, I won't be able to play this video, but I'm going to share it with the Bida and the team so that they can give them to you. Unfortunately, I think because I'm presenting using Canva, um, the sound is being funny. So I'm going to share these videos with, with uh, 211 Check and they can share them with you guys to just help you more. Because as I told you, this training, how much do you go back and fueled by passion and purpose. So um, if you want to learn more about this information, I'll give you this particular story, but it's just a story of how false information undermined uh, the electoral process of the United States in 2016. You remember that, that uh, election that was between uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? That election was marked, I think, with a lot of false information. That's where we even got the narrative of fake news um, that Donald Trump was professing and using. So you realize that uh, false information really affected that country. So you can go back, watch this story that was done by Channel 4 News. It's a very in-depth analysis of um, how uh, these informers, who are best in another country, they're actually best in Macedonia. They best in Macedonia to push narratives that had a lot of inaccurate information. But at the end of the day, it affected many uh, United States uh, citizens, the population, and ended up making decisions that were inaccurate and outrightly false. So even up to today, there is a narrative that because of those false information or that false information, uh, Hillary Clinton was not able to win that election. Yeah, and that thing has been um, something, a subject of debate up to today. Uh, but I, if you can go back, please watch that video. It will be able to, uh, to help you, but I'll share it with uh, the team. Let's continue. So how do you identify similar sources of false information during elections? We realize that, as I told you last time when we were here, that most of the information that goes on, not all, most of the information that goes on on social media, especially during election time, is disinformation. Someone knows what they're sharing is actually inaccurate. They continue to share inaccurate information. So they have a certain agenda. They have a certain intention. There is something they want to achieve by sharing that false information. So how do you identify that this information uh, that is false is similar to this information and there is a connection between them? That is what I want to just touch base on in this time. One, how do you identify familiar sources of false information during uh, uh, elections? I hope you're writing. One, focus on the hashtags used. So stroke follow the hashtags. So these hashtags, they're the ones that push a certain narrative. You know how uh, you want to trend on Twitter, you get a certain hashtag, and this hashtag is posted by another person, and another person also uses that hashtag. So all those hashtags, most of the times have a familiar interest. They have a, a familiar agenda. So look at this hashtag. If this hashtag is hash stop police brutality, so that means they're they are, they are shaping a narrative of the police is brutal. So everybody is bringing in their evidence to show that the police is brutal. So you can look at those hashtags. If it's hash free Bobby Wine, we had that one going on on social media during the time. It's pushing a certain agenda. Hash Museveni Paka last. Now some people hash steady progress. Hash vision 2040. These people all have a certain narrative. So in case you want to see the link between, how to identify the link between that false information, look at that hashtag. That hashtag will bring you all the information that has been posted with that hashtag. And it's going to be easy for you to collaborate to say, okay, this account used this hashtag, but in this perspective, this account used this hashtag in this perspective. What are they pushing? Is there a common thing between them? At the end of the day, you will realize if this, uh, these sources are, are the same and then you can fact check them. I think the gentleman who won um, uh, the, the, the fact checker of the year, last year did a story about this. He's a Nigerian gentleman, I'm forgetting his name. He's a fact checker there, but he, 
he did he, he collaborated how different court accounts were pushing a certain narrative and he he did a fact check on that to show that these things all had a hidden agenda and they were publishing information that was not inaccurate. So that shows you focus on those particular hashtags that will be able to help you as a journalist. Second, look at the authors of that information. So we realize that uh, different authors have different uh, credibility. So there are those authors we know, man, you can trust what they say, you can trust uh, what they write, but there are those authors we know you should be skeptical about them. Sometimes you cannot say that they are outrightly always publishing false information, but there are those we know their information needs to be put on a pedestal, right? So sorry, or put on a weighing machine, just put it and just weigh. Mm, this may be true, this may not be uh, true. So look at those authors. And certain authors can come from a, the same media house, can come from the same organization, they can come from the same entity. So can you put a common denominator there? If they're from the same media house, they're all pushing something that is about that particular story. Mm, let it ring a bell. If they are both from the same political party, they are from the same political affiliation, right? Look at them. This one is saying this. This one is also saying this. Who should we trust, right? Always be able to juxtapose. In the case of, of, of your election, at least we know Salva is coming in 2024. Are, are the people sharing this information, supporters of Salva Kid? Maybe you realize some are his members of parliament, some are his ministers. They, they're all pushing a certain agenda. Fact check all of them, look at all of them, what they are posting. Sometimes they have a narrative they are pushing. So if it's a false a narrative, you can be able to debunk it real time. Let's say Riyak Mashal has also officially said he's going to come in. I'm not sure if he, he, he has officially said, but I'm sure that gentleman may come. He should come in 2024. But when he comes, look at the authors who are, are pushing a certain agenda that is supporting him. Do they all have a common denominator? Maybe they have all worked with, uh, with Riyak Mashal in the, in the past. Maybe they all believe in him. Is there a narrative they are, they are, they are, they are pushing? Fact check that, that narrative ASAP. That is going to be how you're going to be able to um, identify these familiar sources. Look at them, their profiles. Do they fit? Are they friends? Do they work with the same company? Are they under the same media house? That will help you to identify the similar sources of false information. I realized in our previous election that many of the people who are sharing false information all had an icon of Robert Chagulani Center. That means most of them, if not all, were supporting Robert Chagulani Center. So it gives you a common denominator. So these people have a, a common agenda. That means there's something they're trying to push. Um, okay. Let's continue. I was just checking through to, to be sure. Um, third, common denominator. What's the agenda? I've highlighted this. All of them have to have a common denominator. A common denominator is like a common ground, right? So what is the common ground for all these people who are sharing information? What is that that unites what they're saying? What is that that, that they're all talking about? What is that thing that they are, the hashtag they're all using? What is the common denominator among everybody who's sharing that false information? When you know the common denominator, it's very, very easy for you to sit down and say, let, let me let me juxtapose. Let me um, put these things together. Let me see what, what are the common uh, things they have. And you should be able to sit down and critically think because, um, um, and unfortunately, we are in a time where we do not have a lot of critical thinkers, um, especially um, in our journalism. But even generally, uh, the world today, people are not really critically thinking about these things. But you should be able to sit down, focus, be able to take a time you need. Look at every post, look at every wording, look at the agenda that is common. Be highlighting these things. You say, okay, this one is pushing this agenda. This is what is common between them. At the end of the day, when you have a common denominator, it's a best for you to write your fact check, to debunk this information, to say, we got this information from, let's say, for example, Edgar Matthew Karanga posted this information on his Facebook. Then a gentleman called uh, Paulino Angok shared this information but he was also using the words Edgar shared. So you use that example. You get another person who shared the same content. You put them together, then you scrutinize them. This will take a lot of critical thinking from your side. It will take a lot of patience. It will take a lot of creativity and innovation. To look at the details, to look at the hashtags, to look at the spelling mistakes, to, you, to look at the words used, all that. When you have a common denominator, 
boom, you can fact check and identify that these are all from the same uh, maybe community. They all have a common denominator, which is this, right? Point number four, language used. We realize that people who are sharing, who have the same agenda, normally use the same language. They will borrow the words the other person used. If it's a bot, the bot that has, how they program this bot is the, the way they are programming the other bot. Sometimes the words are similar. Sometimes even the, the spelling mistakes are there and they are even common. All of them are using the same spelling mistakes because they're all pushing a certain agenda. So what language are they using? Are they using English language? Um, how are they writing? Um, what are the, the, the words that they are using? What are the uh, punctuation marks they are using? So you, when you realize that all of them have familiar, maybe all of them are starting a, a post with just in, right? Or maybe all of them are starting uh, their post with... Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had someone who had something to say. Okay, I guess it wasn't that. So look at the language that is used. The language can be familiar when people are from the same sources. If they are all bot accounts, they are programmed the same way. They may even use the same words, right? Even use the same question marks and punctuation marks. They have the same hashtag. So look at that language used. Look at the rate of posting from that source. In fact, I, I, it's supposed to be from those sources, the rate of posting from those sources. We realize that sources that have an agenda that have been paid to push a certain narrative, they will be posting it literally every time. When someone is paid money, let's say, you, for example, if you had someone who wanted maybe an influencer uh, to share our training here, to, to tell the world what is happening, uh, the training that is happening between us and South Sudan, so we pay them. They will always post something uh, very, you know, consistently, very much because they have been paid, because they have an agenda. So look at the rate of posting. If it's bots, bots have a common characteristic. They post literally every time. Minute one, they post. Minute three, they post again. Minute four, they post. Minute five. That is that can show you. If you also look at the authors of these different accounts, they are posting one minute. They are posting after five minutes. They are posting time. Mm, okay, look at all those posts, connect them. They have a certain agenda. If you get that agenda, then that, that means you're good to go. You can start your fact-checking process. So look at the rate of posting from these different um, media houses, from these different authors, from these different uh, people. Then how to identify familiar sources or similar sources of false information. The other issue is targeted individuals. As I told you, people who unite to push a certain narrative always have the reason why they're uniting. They have that narrative they are pushing, right? So who are they talking about? Who is being affected by the information that is going on, right? Is it a certain maybe politician from a certain um, media house, uh, sorry, from a certain political party? Is it a media house? Because these days, by the way, we're being attacked as journalists. And if you did not know these days, the fourth estate or the journalists are the one, it's one of the biggest um, occupations that are growing, fast growing, that are impacting, that are so influential. Journalists now are in parliament. Journalists now are doing great things. Journalists now are ministers. So there is a power in what you're doing. So sometimes they can target you as a journalist. They can target your media house. Uh, to try to make it look bad. For example, 211 check decides we are going to fact check the South Sudan 2024 elections. And you start doing that, some people who don't want you to be fact checking this, they will can start something. They can start an algorithm um, affecting you, attacking you, abusing what you're doing, discrediting you, all that, right? Putting stories that may be false on you. So, who are these agendas? Who are these people targeting? What are these accounts saying? Who are they actually talking about? Look at that targeted individual. That can help you because now when you realize this person is attacking the bank media, this person is also attacking the bank. This person is also attacking the bank. It can bring you a common denominator to understand, okay, this, this person said that the bank, uh, they do this, which is wrong. 
this person also said the bank does this, which is wrong. The other person also said the bank does this, which is inaccurate. So you realize all of them are having fabricated stories about the bank media initiative. So that means there is a certain agenda they are trying to push. That means I can debunk all of them and I can even do a fact check that is putting them uh, together. So you can identify and so, okay, so these are familiar sources. There is a narrative they are trying to push about the bank media, which is not actually accurate. I hope we are together. Lastly, the diction, the grammar, and the punctuation that is used. Diction is really the choice of words that someone uses. Uh, grammar is, um, you know, the English used, is it good? Uh, punctuation, where have they put the question marks? Where have they put the commas? I told you, these people have familiar ways of writing. They have familiar ways of uh, disseminating information. So look at the, the words they have used. Look at the grammar. Look at the punctuation. All that, if they have the same diction, if they have the same grammatical mistakes, if they, say they, they still have the same words used, if they put uh, the punctuations exactly where the other person put, you realize, okay, this may be programmed. Someone may be feeding it with a certain narrative that I can debunk as a fact checker. Are we together, gentlemen and ladies? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's good to know that you are there. You know, these online trainings, eh? someone is sitting here, you don't know, some other person may be enjoying themselves. So I always want to hear from you. Sorry, your network was, was jumping, but you are trying to say something. I don't know who exactly that was. Okay, so let's continue. Um, at just 21 minutes past um, 11 a.m., I think, in your time here, it's 21 minutes past 2 or 12 midday. Uh, this was also another video, but because uh, the sound is acting funny, I'll share this video also with the team so that they can give it to you to help you uh, in, you know, in understanding how you can identify similar sources of false information. So we go to uh, our second last topic. And this is really the role of fact checking in fostering democracy, uh, you know, uh, in ensuring that there is voter knowledge, uh, that you're not manipulated. What does fact checking do in preserving the democratic processes of a certain country of preserving the elections, what do you think uh, accurate information can really do in uh, fostering democracy? So uh, this is what we want to talk about. What, what is your job as a fact checker doing uh, to foster democracy? If, even though democracy is not a common phenomenon in this, country, in this, in this continent, but we believe we can change this narrative, right? Uh, slowly by slowly, a day at a time. But what, has, what is our role as fact checkers? What are we doing? Uh, to make sure that we um, ensure democracy at the end of the day. One, through our fact-checking, there is improved quality of debate among politicians. This was really a common phenomenon, especially in um, 2016, uh, during the United States um, elections. You realize that uh, Donald Trump, everybody started to realize he was giving us a lot of false information and the fact checkers started to do their job. Uh, full fact was doing a lot of fact checking there in. Uh, so when they started fact checking, you realize that some of the claims that Donald Trump was making, they, they were, was making, they started to go down, right? He started not to mention some because he realized people are fact checking him and they're giving people the right information. And of course, when people hear that um, he is, uh, lying, that means they will not trust him again. So we realized that uh, false information, um, or, sorry, um, debate was starting to be of quality. Uh, he was no longer sharing false information. And it's the same setting here. Uh, when you fact check these politicians, uh, for example, if a politician is lying about uh, something and you fact check them, then there is improved quality of debate, especially among politicians. You know, politicians eat from lying. They're like lawyers, but that is my opinion. They don't fact check me. But uh, for me, I believe politicians and lawyers, they are just people who just uh, get their money from really playing around with our minds. So there's improved quality of debate through fact checking. There is an informed citizenry. You people, the citizens, ask the journalists, we can make informed decisions because we have the right information, right? If we have the wrong information, that means we make false decisions, decisions that are based on a false perspective. By the way, you can be true, but also false at the end of the day. Because for you, you think 
the thing you're deciding about is truth and you're doing it from a very good heart, but you're making a wrong decision based on wrong information. But if you have right information, you make right decisions. That means your decision is informed. That means if someone comes and lies to you, like how the president was saying that uh, Uganda was now a middle income country, I went, I did a fact check about that and I'm like, Mr. President, Uganda is not yet there. You are misleading the population. So someone who watches my video can be able to know that maybe the president may be misleading here and there. So it is informed. They can make a decision that is informed at the end of the day. Reduced violence. When people have uh, the right information, it's going to be difficult for them to fight. Why should they fight? Because they know this is the right information. This thing was free and fair. They beat us hands down, like in the recently uh, concluded elections. For the first time, we saw a candidate uh, that was Oyam constituency. Um, just to give you a brief background on that, um, the minister, a, a member of parliament and same time minister in the 70s government, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Ch Colonel Charles Engwala, uh, he, he, he was killed, unfortunately, shot by his private guard. And his constituency had to do a re-election. So his son, uh, Samuel Engwala came uh, to replace the father. But for the first time in history, um, I think because the president, uh, you know, criticized how um, people were, you know, stealing elections and rigging, we had a candidate from the Uganda Post Congress win such an election. And you know what it means when a minister, uh, okay, for us here, when a minister really dies in such a way and his position, his son does not win. It's very rare. I think it's something that has not happened. Most of the people who die, MPs, ministers who die, their sons replace them, or their people from their families replace them. Sometimes they have replaced them through fraudulent elections, right? Because at, at any cost, they are willing to win at any cost because it looks bad when someone has not won yet. They were a big minister, maybe, or something like that. But in this election of Oyam, the recently concluded one, a UPC candidate, a lady, came. And one that the, the, the son of uh, the minister, something that they had not yet seen. There was no violence. There was nobody beaten because the president said we need free and fair elections. So it shows you when people realize that, okay, the election was actually true. They beat us hands down. Yes, we are NRM. We are in government. We have the numbers. We have the police. Uh, one minister said they have the MAJ. MAJ is like the military. I don't know what happened because they, they, they won her constituency. But that shows you that when people are contented with the election results, they are true and the results are actually accurate. And fact checkers have also confirmed that these things are accurate. There is reduced violence, right? Then informed decision making processes. People are making decisions from an informed point of view because they have the facts right. So when they have the facts right, they make the right decision. Acute trust in the election processes. You remember when I told you that false information undermines trust in the election processes? So because of false, because of the right information or accurate information, there is trust in the election processes. Like now you see um, you know, countries that have a default democracy. Yes, there may be some challenges here and there, but people really trust that when we go and vote, our candidate shall win, or the right candidate or the winner will be pronounced. But in a country like ours, people go in the election when they already have that mindset, we are one nil down. We have already been won. Uh, we cannot win this thing, right? So when there is accurate information during elections, people have that trust in the election processes. And if the people have trust in the election processes, that means there's reduced anarchy, there's reduced war, there's, you know, there, there's a bit of fairness and people like to be fair. Um, there is increased voter turn up. I told you when people have the right information, they come to vote. You will see this in, in, when you start voting. You realize that people, when they no longer trust the election process, they will not come for the voting. They'll be like, okay, you guys do whatever you do. For us, we know what will happen. And sometimes they actually are true. So increased voter turn up. Then, um, just a minute. Then um, we have free and fair elections. So because of fact checking, because of accurate information, there's free and fair elections. There is no violence during the election. Uh, we have peace everywhere. You know, people are happy when they are going to vote, to cast their vote. The votes are counted when everybody's seeing. Um, 
you know, the district return office has taken um, those things to the tally center. The right person is actually, um, you know, um, declared. The challenge is when you don't do this, that means we have people who are disenfranchised, who are not happy. You are not right. That means people, will, like in Uganda here, people will not go and really fight. The only time we tried to protest was in November, that is 2020, and 50 died. So people now fear that. But deep in their hearts, they do not forget. Because by the justice that is not given, even after how long, people still feel disenfranchised. So when people know that they were beat free and fairly, at least for you, absolve yourself. So there is a free and fair election at the end of the day. But when people know that you played around with their uh, election, those that are as maybe a, a bit fearing like Ugandans, they will keep quiet. They will speak in their small corridors that, hey, we're not happy, we're being treated wrong. But there are those who do not really you know, care. They will straight away carry arms and go. You remember I told you in 1980, a gentleman did not even go to court to say, okay, since they rigged my election, in fact, it was not him that was rigged, unfortunately. It was Paul Samuel Gerede, who was rigged, but uh, he's the one who felt the pain, Mr. Museveni. He went and fought. 500,000 Ugandans lost their lives in that particular war, right? But if, let's say, the elections were actually accurate, that means there was no uh, legitimacy for going to fight, right? But if there is a bit of irregularities, a bit of unfairness, even if it's this small, it gives people who are called out, they call them outliers. Those are people in every generation that critically think that, that always have that, that zeal. So they like them seven is, you give them a reason because there is irregularities, you give them a reason to go and fight, right? Sometimes it may not be about them, but it is actually there. It is free, it is unfree and unfair. So they have a basis to, 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 to show their grievances to fight against the status quo, which sometimes be, uh, fuels a lot of intrigue and violence. Then um, there is merit-based win by politicians. You win on merit. You realize many people share false information about candidates. I told you this information. They, someone intentionally sits down and they attack you because maybe you're competing with them in a certain uh, um, election or something like that. So they deliberately go out and attack you and attack um, your persona. But in, when there is accurate information, there is merit best win. Someone wins because they're actually true, because what they speak is actually the reality, right? So there is merit best win because the facts are there. This person has, people have made decisions based on the facts. This person they are voting, they, they voted for him, he's the right one who's there. So this person has won on merit. Not many members of parliament in this country win on merit. Um, then lastly, there is equality among political candidates. So because all of us are on the same level, there is equality. Um, all of us are equal. All of us have been judged right. All of us, have, those who have been judged and found lacking, they are judged and found lacking based on accurate information. Those who uh, have been, uh, you know, judged and found to be right, they are judged and found right based on the right information. So there is equality among politicians, not someone pushing a certain agenda that is wrong and some other people believing it and yet it's actually not right. So there is equality among political players. So that is really what you doing as a fact checker, fact checking election processes, how it can help in fostering democracy and trust. And the good thing is that for you, you still have time to push this agenda. You still have time to push this narrative of, hey, every election that we shall have, in the history of South Sudan, starting from the first, we have been fact checking. It can even bring you credibility over time. Imagine after 25 years or 30 years, that means after six terms, you have been fact-checking. You have always fact-checked those elections. You have always had the right information. Even people uh, from uh, international organizations will come to you because they trust you, because you have um, you have a track record. You have a track record of fact-checking elections. So I think this is something that is very organic and something that you can push. And it's a narrative for those of you who have a vision um, that, is, that is far, that is really impactful 
this is something you can be doing. At the end of the day, it will pay off one way or another. But it's not only just going to pay off to you monetary wise, no. There is a block that you're adding on your country that at the end of the day, they'll remember you to say this gentleman has always been a fact checker. He fact checked our elections. He reduced, uh, they, they have fostered democracy over time. He is a man who will leave a mark on South Sudan, right? So those are some of the things that you can do to leave a mark for yourself as an individual, but also to create impact. Because a life where when you die, your memory goes, you know there are some people who when they die, they forget you, uh, even your memory, uh, the memory of that person is no longer in the people, you have completely gone. But there are some icons who even up to today, they have died a long, long time ago. We are still talking about them because they created a mark. So with you um, undertaking fact-checking, especially during elections, but also generally fact-checking and verifying information, that will make you stand out as an individual in your community, uh, in your country, and create an impact that is lasting, really, because it's something that is new. And you are blessed to be in such a, a generation like this, in such a time like this, when people are writing history, you people are writing history, the things that you are seeing today, the people, uh, some people who are your children may not even see them, but for you, you they will just read about them, but for you, you were here at a time when South Sudan was transitioning to become a democratic um, you know, country that carries out regular free and fair election, which is something I wish for you guys. So lastly, um, what are some of the, of the lessons for South Sudan fact checkers? What do you need to learn from other fact checkers? What have they done wrong? Um, I'll just tell you that it's not all it's not all beds of roses, you know, all glitz and glamour uh, from other fact checkers. I cannot have the moral authority to say that we are the most perfect of them all, right? But one thing I know is that there are some things that we have gone through that you can learn from us and, and, and it will be easy for you to protect yourself first as a journalist, but generally as a fact checker. How do you protect yourself? What are some of the lessons you're learning from us that will help you in doing your work better, in avoiding the mistakes we have gone through? Because most of us, and I, this thing we've been learning on the job, we started a thing that we felt was you know, pertinent, important, and timely, but we're still learning on the job. Um, you wake up and you just, you know, these times you make a mistake, but you go back. So you as a South Sudan fact checker, someone who's starting out, these are some of the lessons that you should learn that will help you at the end of the day uh, to leave a lasting mark or to be a better fact checker uh, than us, to create a lasting impact, a mark. One, strengthen those networks. This is generally uh, for journalists as well, uh, even for people. Um, strengthen those networks. Have something that unites all of you. Maybe it's an organization, maybe it's anything, just strengthen, make those WhatsApp groups uh, with other journalists, with other fact-checking organizations, with other people. The more you are many, the merrier, the more impact you create. Um, even is the more, the, the more even you can get even the funding, right? Uh, people support many people who are together. It's easy to support people who are in a group than someone who's alone. It's, it's easy to attack someone who's alone than people who are in a group. But when you have a group, it will be able to share information, share experiences, pitch for resources, create a lasting impact together because you are many. Two, a lesson for South Sudan fact checkers from other fact checkers, share experiences and collaborations. Be willing to collaborate. Be willing to show up, to come and you know do something. Be willing to work with other fact checkers. Be willing to work with other fact checking organizations. Have common challenges. Address those challenges uh, together. Because when you're together, it's easily to it's easy to implement. It's easy to move further, right? Last uh, third, be independent and bias proof in your line of work. Independence is something that is very pertinent and. Uh, Independence really does not mean to you to just give information like that. Okay, I'm independent. No. Someone is independent, in my perspective, is someone who's siding with the truth, who's siding with the facts. That is independent. Whether the facts work for you, whether they don't work for you, whether they work for your preconceived bias, whether they don't, that is 
the truth. So we as journalists, we stand for the truth. We are not really neutral, but we are standing for the truth. If something is true, speak it. Be independent in the truth. Speak the truth and at least let them judge you. It's okay. But at least you have washed your hands from that. You say, for me, I've told you the reality. This is the truth, right? So be independent in the work you do. And independence brings about credibility. And when you're credible, people trust you as a journalist. That's already a win for you. Number four, use the fact-checking tools. The fact-checking tools are just the beginning. They are not the end. They are not the alpha and the omega. Fact-checking tools will give you information. For those who have used them, you can go back if you haven't used them, go back and learn them. There's Google River Search, TinEye, Yandex, um, Photo Forensics, Botometer, many, Google Earth. Go look at them, learn them. But these tools, what they do is they give you information. You are the intellect behind those tools. So when they give information, you interpret the information that will help you, you leave out that information that won't help you. So use these fact-checking tools. They'll make your work simpler as a journalist. Another point, research is paramount. Follow up on what other fact checkers are doing to fact check elections. So if you are not a researcher, um, I'm telling you here without any fear of contradiction is that you're in the wrong place. If you're gonna be a journalist, especially a fact checker, you are going to be able to research. Research is not easy. You have to sit down and Wikipedia is not research by the way. You sitting on your computer and putting in, um, you know, something, that does not really make, that is not really research. It's just a starting of research. You have got information that is on the internet. There is information that may not be on the internet. Go to those libraries. Go to those universities. There are research proposals that have been done. Check through them. Go to the website. Check through all these things because I'm telling you, research is something that is very, very paramount for a fact checker. Because if you don't research very well, you're going to be ended, you're, you're, ended, you're going to be fact-checked at the end of the day. And when you're fact-checked, there is nothing more embarrassing like that. Right? So research is paramount. No fact check is bigger than your life. No investigation is bigger than your life. That is something you should learn. Your life is the alpha and omega. If a story is going to be harmful to you, I would prefer you drop the story. If you feel you want to die as a hero, you can continue. But when you're dead, there's nothing to show, right? And people should understand that there's a thin line between you being a hero and being a martyr, right? Because you, you, can, you can be martyred. And you remember you as how we remember the martyrs, but you're dead. So for me, I advise you to avoid, uh, you know, um, stories that are going to take your life. I have been there. In my media house where I work from, uh, my TV, digital TV. One time we were raided by the security operatives. Nine journalists out of 10 were arrested and taken. In fact, I was the 10th who was the lucky one who remained outside. And I was the one to start talking to the media. You people have arrested our people. We don't know where they are. They are taken in safe houses. Those boys, when they came back, they were tortured. Many of those, uh, the girls were beat. Their psychology is no longer, they, you know, mental health is no longer okay. They have hallucinations. But you, you, that is the cost of, of, of the story. But at what cost, really? You know, many of them even quit the space. I, I have friends, especially two girls, who after that incarceration experience, they never came back. They said, now, nah, you people, stay with your things. We are not ready to continue doing journalism. So, that can show you how it affected them. But imagine if one of them had died, unfortunately. You know, these days you have a, a phenomenon of stray bullets. I don't know what stray really means, but stray bullets, someone just, you die, right? And when you are dead, you are dead. We shall cry. As we are crying, we are eating the food also that, you, that, that they have prepared on the barrier. So please be careful. No story is worth your life. Ah, the other thing, avoid confirmation biases. Confirmation biases are those things you have preconceived that you already believed inside you. For example, that, Mosef, that you cannot win an election in Uganda. So when they bring you any evidence that shows that it's easy, you accept it very well, right? Because you have preconceived it. So those confirmation biases are very, very, um, you know, not good for you. There are some things that 
um, will affect your work as a journalist. Have an open mind. Be open to learning. Not all of you, not everything we all know. Be open to listen from other people, to learn from them, to learn from their experiences. And it's extremely humbling when you when you learn from someone who is even lesser than you. So you, he's a great person. Maybe this person he looks young, looks immature. But my dear, learn from them because you never know. We have a, a saying in Uganda that no moto nozina, which means, or which is literally translated to say, even a young child can play for you the drum and you dance, right? So please. Uh, avoid those confirmation biases. Be willing to learn, and that brings me then to the next uh, to the next point. Never stop learning. You are someone. Uh, things are dynamic. So people who used to do journalism in the nineties today cannot do. In fact, nineties are even far. Let's talk about people who used to do journalism in two thousand nineteen, before the pandemic came. Is it the still the, still the same case here in twenty twenty three after the pandemic? No. You realize that the pandemic brought in a, 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 you know, a new phenomenon. The people work from home these days, right? Uh, people can hold trainings like these ones online. So you realize that there's something that can be done. There's something that can be done that are different. So never stop learning. Learn, learn, and also unlearn. There are some things you should also unlearn. The, the things you believed, the things you always accepted, unlearn those things as well. Then capacity building is crucial. What do we mean by capacity building? Realize that our vision, if it's to fight false information and fake news, we cannot achieve it alone the way we are. We are too little. But the more we replicate this, the more we train people, the more we teach other people how to fact check information, that means we are growing a culture in the community. That means we are pushing the vision that we have. So capacity building is, 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 is key. I've told you that for me, at least, I can proudly say that this year alone, I have trained more than five universities in this country with each university not having less than 40 students. That means when you look at it, I've trained a total of more than 200 students. Those students, when you add on the journalists that we have trained here, there's a ripple effect. They're also training other people. They're also having an idea. I'm telling you, few years down the road, we shall see an impact of the things we are doing today. So capacity building for you to do other, to, to teach other people, but also to allow other people to teach you, to learn new things that you did not know. And then lastly, patience is key, right? Patience in terms of, this is just even uh, a thing that applies with life. Patience is one by one makes a bundle. Do not rush because you have a problem of journalists wanting to break the story fast. It's not bad as long as you, 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 you break the right information. But when you break the wrong information, that means you're increasing on the rate of false information. So be patient, go do your research, conduct it very well, do the interviews, bring your story. Instead of rushing to give us work that is not up to date, work that can even be embarrassing to yourself. There are some stories I did in the past and I look at myself and I'm like, no, was this me? I want to, to, to really <laughs> do those stories, but still it is me. So impatience is something that is wrong. Be patient with the story you're doing. Be patient with the fact check. Give us something that is comprehensive. And at the end of the day, we shall be able to make uh, informed decisions. So with uh, those words, in Uganda, they say, with those few words, especially the politician, he has talked for like an hour. And then after he says, with those few words, <laughs> allow me to say bye, but with these many words that I've spoken from the time we started at 10, allow me just um, say, uh, in case you have any question, please share, because we've literally come to the end of this particular discussion. So feel free to just um, unmute yourself. If you're not comfortable speaking, you can also still text in the chat. I can be able to read your messages, but any question that you have for me, now is your time. Okay, someone wants you to resend their attendance. Uh, kindly resend their attendance. Yeah, it has been resent. All right. Anybody with a question? Any query? Any complimentation? 
Yes, I have a questions. Hello? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much for the wonderful lesson that we have been enjoying for these hours. Uh, my questions goes to Moses. I think Moses is my questions is regarding uh, regarding about uh, the air times or the refinement because in the beginning of the sessions, I did not receive any single, but uh, according to our uh, during the submissions that uh, the air time should be provided for the after the end of the sessions, but I don't know how, why, so I need a clarification on that. Okay, GB or anybody from the team, do you want to address that, that question? So, okay. Uh, uh, Matthew, for today's wonderful it was very nice. I joined earlier, but my laptop was having some issues. I could not talk from the beginning. But uh, I appreciate all the work you've done and uh, the training and the content, all the examples and the lessons that we can take. They're really, very really nice. Like for us, in uh, the next 12 of months, we are seeing 12 of also months, we are coming into an election. so. All this content is very useful to us and everyone in South Sudan. Uh, to uh, the question, Paulino's question. Yes, we promised yes. you uh, airtime reimbursement. Yeah, we promised each and every one of you airtime reimbursement, but uh, we had yes. options that maybe it will be done after the end of March. Yes or after the end of the training. Yeah, so we are still working oh. out on that. Nobody wants to do oh, OK, thank you. And uh, thank you for that. Yeah, none, of, none of the participants has gotten. So when we shall have worked um, out, we shall let you know. The training is still ongoing. OK, okay. thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, GB. Okay. Thank you, Paulino, for that question. Anybody else mm -hmm. who has any question, a compliment, or anything to add on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Oh, that's what you Okay. So they always say that silence is um, a yes. Some people can take it to be a no. Hello. Hello. Yes, please, sir. Yes. Yeah. Close. I will see you, yeah. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Yes. You know, uh, I just want to talk about the, the upcoming uh, elections in South Sudan. You know, mm. uh, uh, you know uh, for journalists to be safe and for journalists to do their work, uh, in a very free environment, in a conducive environment. So, uh, what what kind of you know what kind of preparation do journalists need in order to cope with the environments of election? Because this will be the first time for South Sudan to go for such events, to go for such events uh, since the independent. So we need to know exactly. Uh, and it and 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 uh, and is going to have a lot of, you know, uh, tough kind of, like now there are a lot of uh, signs, and everyone is claiming a lot of things, you know. So uh, how are you know how are we going to cope with that upcoming environment or upcoming elections uh, in the country because the uh, situation itself. Uh, with intimidations, with, uh, you know, SPLM claiming that uh, even if other political parties are not ready to go for election, SPLM alone will go for elections. So now, uh, with that environment itself, uh, indicating all this, so how are journalists going to, 
you know, to cover such situation. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Riyak. Um, first of all, I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but as, as Riyak has also mentioned, uh, it's going to be very difficult for you guys to go through an election that is not going to, ma to be mad with a lot of irregularities. That I can speak without fear of contradiction and you can fact check me in 2024, December, and tell me if I was lying. I'm telling you there will be a lot of irregularities here and there. But we mentioned, we talked about this, um, some of the things you can do to be at a safe side as a, as a journalist. One, ensure a network with other people, your colleagues, other journalists. Make sure you, you, are, you talk to them, make sure you share some information, you share resources. In times when some journalists have been arrested, abducted, be able to, you know, speak together as uh, journalists. Then we also said, go to these polling agents. In order to avoid false information, go to the polling agents, go to the polling stations where the votes are being casted from, count them, take photos of those um, results, be on the ground. Don't just sit and be at the comfort of your internet because sometimes the internet may be switched or social media may be switched off. So we also said, um, look at the DR forms um, to avoid false information there. Look at the forms uh, that, that have the number of people that voted, uh, that have the number of people, the votes that each candidate got, look at them. We also said, upload your content in somewhere that is uh, safe, an external drive in a, in a different place because we realize um, you may have one, uh, device, maybe it's your card camera and your camera, they may be conf confiscated, they may be destroyed. So if you have, or when you have uh, various uh, places you've backed up uh, your data, very easy for you to protect yourself and fact check. Be vigilant, you as a journalist, be vigilant on who is following you, who is tracking your phone, um, who is making attacks on you, who is intimidating you because sometimes intimidations may come if you're doing a very good, tremendous job. So look at that. Uh, we also said for you to be safe with the right information, go check official websites, official sources of information. What does the South Sudan Electoral Commission say? Uh, what does their website say? So look at those things. They will be able to help you to protect yourself. But generally, there is no one size fits all that this is what you can do, but those are some of the basics that can help you in getting the right information first, but also ensuring that you are safe and sound during the election. And the other thing I think you can do is lastly pray. Pray to be safe, because when everything you've done uh, is, is, is you know, there, the only thing that can protect you at the end of the day, who's the author of life? It is God. So you pray for yourself and your country. Yeah, any question? Any other question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yeah, this is Theophilos uh, from Maturid, Eastern Equatoria. Uh, my network is a bit uh, not okay at the moment. Uh, yeah, what's, uh, what I want to know, actually, more especially in regards to those uh, actually placed at the polling centers, maybe during elections, uh, maybe according to your observations, I know you have actually been analyzing and have seen uh, what was actually going on in Uganda uh, sometimes uh, during the election. And uh, maybe uh, who uh, are those people maybe selected by the candidate who is standing for election or those are the people actually uh, trained by the country leadership to make some follow up uh, in the ongoing election. Thank you. OK, um, thank you. Uh, it's unfortunate that it is true. Um, most of the people who are working on these polling agents uh, in the Ugandan setting are all chosen by the incumbent. In fact, even the, the head of the electoral commission in our country is appointed by the president. So that has brought a lot of inconsistencies where some people ask themselves, is someone who was chosen by another person able to declare someone who's not that person, right? Because it's like you going for a football match and um, you, 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 you are the one who's hosting, right? If they are at your stadium, then you are the one who chose the referee, then you are the one who chose the spectators that should enter, 
you're right. You're the one who chose uh, um, the ball that is going to be kicked. Literally, to some extent, you have you have a more high ground, uh, better or a more advantage or a bigger advantage than your colleague or your other colleagues. So it's also the same phenomenon here that the president appoints the electoral commission, the, ch the chairman of the electoral commission, and of course the people who will work with them, the agents, all those are appointed by the incumbent or by someone who is in power at the time. So that has really undermined our election processes. And of course, we are in a time where we want to do some electoral reforms because the constitution is the one that gives Mr. President the power to do that. So we are trying to find a way of uh, how can we advocate for not only just uh, the president having the being the alpha and omega, right? How about the people themselves? So that is something that we are also trying to look out for. But it's it's unfortunately true that in Uganda here, that is what happens. Mr. President chooses everybody. I don't know if that's going to be the same case, but I hope your constitution has better protected you and gave independence to the electoral commission because that, those are the electoral reforms that uh, the opposition is trying to bring in parliament to be able to change so, such things of the president being the one to appoint uh, the, the electoral commission, everybody there, because how can someone you pay be able not to declare you as a winner, right? So that's a, that's a common phenomenon. Any last question? Because it's exactly 1 p.m. This is the time we're supposed to be ending. Any question? Okay. So if there is no